And welcome once again, my friends, to another episode of the Red Delta Project live feed Q&A and podcast here on the RDP YouTube channel, where we are helping you be fit and live free by taking a fundamental approach to diet and exercise. As always, I'm Matt Schifferly. Today's episode is sponsored by the entirety of the RDP library. Links down below to a plethora of the books like my micro workouts, grind style calisthenics, overcoming isometrics, and so on. Lots of these I'm going to be referring to in today's episode, so the links to those are all down below. And today's topic is a doozy because we've been kind of going on a little bit of a building muscle and hypertrophy topic over the past several episodes. I encourage you to look at uh, several of the ones we've already recorded, like last week on several different ways or six ways that you are leaving potential growth and gains on the table. And today what we're doing is we're talking about strategies to help you push, quote, beyond failure pushing your muscles to a higher degree of fatigue in the hopes that it can stimulate any further hypertrophy from where you have now or more than you currently are experiencing. But before we get into those strategies, let's clear the air on a couple of myths and misconceptions on what it means to go to failure, because there's a lot of debate out there in our fitness culture on what going to failure is and what exactly it entails and all this sort of things. And like a lot of debates in uh, our fitness culture online, you're going to kind of get lost in the weeds. So first and foremost, why do we even care? Why do we even look at this sort of thing? And the reason for that is because a lot of the evidence and the science behind why we build muscle is still kind of unknown. It's still a little bit of a mystery in our uh, evidence-based approach, if you would call it that. The real fact of the matter is that we don't have an exact full 100% understanding on how and why we build muscle. Anytime that we take a look at any single factor of exercise, like tearing down muscle or hormones or range of motion or what tools we're using or what rep range, anytime that we're looking at what's the one reason why we're building muscle, it's almost always inevitably a loose correlation at best because whatever we take, for example, like muscle damage, it's like, okay, we damage muscle and we build it back through super compensation. This is the idea that I grew up with when I first started to be a coach and a lot of people still hold now. It's like, that's why we build muscle. But it's not really an X to Y cause and effect relationship because there's plenty of examples where people will damage a muscle and we'll have an uptick in muscle protein synthesis. We'll have a lot more uh, seemingly growth in short time. But overall, net gain isn't experienced. And this is usually the case, lots of things. I know uh, sometimes you'll find an amino acid gets a lot of press. Like, oh, this is the amino acid that kicks off protein synthesis or causes our muscles to get bigger and stuff. And again, inevitably, whenever they test it out in laboratory and controlled conditions, they'll find, eh, it's not really that much of a reliable cause and effect. So overall, the idea of how exactly and why do we build muscle is still, like I said, a bit of a mystery. However, we do have very heavy correlations behind certain behaviors. And it's probably one of those cases where it's a lot of factors that all come into play and they collectively build up to a hypertrophy stimulus. So it's not really something of you do X, you're going to build muscle. But one of the things that is very heavily correlated with creating a stimulus for hypertrophy is developing a very high degree of muscular fatigue. And again, we're not exactly sure why this is happening. It could be because of metabolic stress. It could be because of there's some degree of muscle damage. It could be because of how much uh, higher threshold muscle fibers and motor units you're using. There's not a lot of understanding of exactly why this is happening, but nonetheless, it is one of those things that in the laboratory, they're finding that, look, you can use a number of loading parameters, you can use a number of tools and exercises and techniques, as long as you're taking a muscle to a pretty good degree of failure, where it's having trouble contracting in a given set of circumstances, that's probably a good bet you're creating a stimulus for hypertrophy. So that's kind of what we're going after, is we're going after that with these strategies of just creating more fatigue. So naturally then the argument goes, okay, more fatigue, more growth, or at least greater chance of growth. So I'll take everything to failure then. 
I'll just push to failure. That way I know I'm pushing as hard as I can, and that's going to probably give me the best chance. But time out on that thought as well, because muscular failure, going to failure is another one of those things that has lots of different interpretations and perceptions in the world of fitness. You tell about going to failure for one individual and they think it means that you're doing one thing, but you talk about going to failure to another person and they think you're doing something very different. And the reason for that is because pushing ourselves to failure is actually a heck of a lot more subjective than we often realize that it is. Uh, ideally, it kind of sounds like, well, I'm doing bicep curls and I'm just keep going until I've like used up all of the juice in the muscle, so to speak. I've used up all the fuel. I've pushed the muscle as hard as it could possibly go. I can't possibly do any more. Therefore, I've depleted the muscle fully. Therefore, that's failure, right? Yeah, but is it really though? Is it really? Because always remember that when we are doing an exercise, we have a number of performance variables that go into the mix, kind of like ingredients in a cake, if you will. There's lots of different variables other than just muscular strength and endurance. We also have coordination. We have stability. We have the ability to push ourselves mentally. We have emotional motivation. We have the ability to continue doing an exercise to a, per, a, per, a certain amount of performance proficiency is what I'm trying to say there. So when we are going to failure, the real question we should be asking ourselves is failure of what? What is the weakest link in that exercise that's causing you to stop? And very often, it's not your muscles. For example, I was just training a gentleman this past week, and he has a history where he didn't really do a whole lot of exercise or fitness growing up as a kid. And inevitably, a lot of times, whenever I train middle-aged and older adults, and they have like very little history of any athletics or performance or anything like that, they come to the table with less of a perception of what it means to really push themselves. Because that is one of those things, you just only can learn it through experience. Like when I got into bike racing in college, I was a martial artist. I had been hiking and skiing and bike racing and riding rather, not so much racing, but riding for years up to that point. And I thought I knew what it meant to push myself really hard. And then I got into bike racing. I was like, oh my gosh, like my perception of what hard really was totally went out the window because where I thought my limits were, wasn't even close, right? What I thought was hundred percent turned out to be more like 60%, maybe even lower than that. So anyway, training this individual and he stops doing his pushups and he stands up and I'm kind of like the cheeky trainer. And I asked him, so you okay? What'd you stop for? He's like, oh, that's all I had. That's pushed it all the way to failure. That was everything I had. I'm like, no, I'm not buying it. Based on your range of motion, your speed, your tempo, your body position, all these other things, that was not as hard as you could have gotten. You definitely could have gotten at least three or four more reps, at least that. But he didn't know that because his mental perception of where he could stop or should stop or had to stop was lower than what his muscles could actually do. And in the interest of creating that hypertrophy stimulus, we definitely want to be pushing the limits of our muscular work capacity. In other words, the muscle tissues themselves are near their limit of how much they can contract. That's what we want to do. And if you're doing exercises or doing things that you're stopping for reasons other than that, you are technically going to failure, but it's not necessarily pushing the muscle all that hard. And if it's not pushing it all that hard, you're potentially, again, leaving gains on the table. And that's not to say that you have to push the muscle to its absolute limit. That's certainly been established very solidly because honestly, I don't think most people ever push their muscles to the absolute limit. When uh, convict conditioning came out, Paul Wade talks about don't go to failure. And I think his perception of what failure meant was pushing yourself so hard that the muscles literally just give up. Like you you can do this. I've seen it happen very rarely where someone will be pushing and it's like their nervous system just hits the fail safe button, the eject button, and it's just boom, everything kind of shuts off. I think that's what Paul Wade was talking about. But it's not something I think a lot of people need to worry about because honestly, I don't think most people really push themselves to that level, 
let alone on a frequent basis. You've got to have a ton of motivation and you've got to have the right circumstances to have that happen. And I honestly don't think most people are getting there. So that's one type of failure. Another type of failure, again, people are like, I use technical failure. I go until my form starts to break down. Again, is that really the limit of your muscular capacity? Or is that the limit of your ability to maintain your stability or the skill or the proficiency of the exercise? So you're going after one type of limitation where you really kind of want to go after the other. And all of this, basically what it means is that we want to make sure that if we're trying to build muscle, we want to use exercises and strategies that are going to put the muscular work capacity as the weakest link in the system. So we want exercises that are technically simple, that don't require a whole lot of balance, skill, or stability, and that are relatively easy and comfortable mentally and emotionally to do. Because when those things are taken care of, chances are much better that you're going to run more into the limitations of the muscle and your neuromuscular system itself. And you have to stop because it's like, I just can't contract my muscles like this anymore. I'm still stable. I'm still comfortable. I still want to keep going, but I'm just not doing it. Which brings me to the last point that we want to bring up is that the biggest reason why pushing ourselves to failure is much more subjective is because when we push to failure, what we're actually doing, it's let's say in a bicep curl, we're you know in an ideal situation, we're still hitting the limits of our muscles. All the other things are not being limited. That's not why we're stopping. But what you're really doing is you're hitting a failure of the muscle to contract for that specific exercise done that specific way. It's not the limits of the muscles, it's the limits of the muscles to perform that specific action, which goes into why some of these strategies work. Because if we've truly hit the limits of our muscles, what's actually going on is your muscle wouldn't be able to work much afterwards at all, which of course is not the case. So if I'm curling you know, 30 pound dumbbells and I get to the point where I just can't curl anymore, I put the dumbbells down, the biceps are still plenty fresh to keep going, just not at that level of resistance. So what we're talking about when we mean failure of a muscular system, we're actually talking about the failure of the ability of the muscle to generate that much tension. That's what it really is, because then I can grab 20 pound dumbbells and keep going. You know, muscles still have plenty of juice in them. So it's like walking into a store with $100 spending 60 and saying, now I'm broke, I have no money left over. And it's like, no, you still have plenty left over. And that's why a lot of times when we talk about failure, it's not necessarily fully depleting yourself. You're, you're still having a lot left in the tank. And some of these strategies are about getting you to tap into that further reserve to create more fatigue in the muscle. And there's a couple of reasons why you may wanna do this. One is again, to give ourselves the better chance of creating enough fatigue to stimulate hypertrophy. Because you just never know, maybe you've got a mental block, maybe you've got an emotional block, maybe you're just bored, whatever, and you're stopping the exercise for reasons other than the fact that you really haven't worked the muscle quite that hard. So these can ensure that yes, you're definitely getting it done. It's kind of like hitting a nail into the into board, right? And you stop with the nails halfway sticking out. This is kind of like ensuring that you're hitting it and driving it all the way. So that's the first reason. Second reason is because sometimes it can be just more satisfying to feel like you've pushed yourself a little bit more. You're not quite leaving as much fatigue on the table. But the, the other thing to always also keep in mind about this is that uh, this can potentially not work entirely in your favor, it, which is that as, as much as the research shows there's a strong correlation between muscular fatigue and hypertrophy, there's also a decent amount of research that shows that excessive fatigue probably doesn't help a whole lot. You know, there's some articles over on Stronger by Science and stuff that look at some of these strategies and they show that, yeah, you can use these strategies, but it didn't really do anything beyond just regular straight set training, like three sets of 10 kind of stuff. So it, while it does seem to mean that there is a correlation between fatigue and muscle growth, there also does seem to be this, this evidence to support the idea that there's a diminishing rate of return pretty quick. It's kind of like pulling the trigger of a gun. You need enough force to pull that trigger, but once you fire the gun, squeezing the trigger harder isn't going to do anything for you. So do be kind of aware of whether or not this stuff is compromising your recovery 
and leading to things like mental, emotional burnout, sore joints, that sort of thing. Because yes, more fatigue can potentially mean more gains, but that doesn't always mean that more fatigue is always better. And definitely kind of check yourself a little bit here, especially in the recovery front of things. But before I jump into it, let's get to, into some of the questions and stuff. Folks coming in, Dave is here, Math Math is here, Leo is here, Sniffrad. Oh man, the whole gang is here. Holy smokes, folks. It is great to see you, everybody. Dave is asking, hey, Matt, do you think it might be mental that I can't get more than 20 bodyweight rows, but can do seven to eight jackknife pull-ups? I can almost guarantee. So one of the things that I've noticed personally when training clients is that when the rep numbers go higher, like over 15 and stuff, it's almost inevitably more a mental block than anything else because it's just beating you up with those numbers. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. And the fatigue is building up, but we have to spend more time in a high fatigue state with the higher numbers. Because if you can do 20 body weight rows, you're probably feeling fairly worked at 10. And then at 15, you're pretty smoked. So those last five or so are really gonna be agony, but you can probably keep going. Now, one thing that I've noticed for myself to get reps up is just simply moving at a faster pace. Because remember that your muscles fundamentally don't understand what repetitions are. They only know time and tension. So if you go faster and you're spending less time with each rep, then you're gonna get more reps just because there's less time that you're spending it. Yes, you are creating more tension in the muscle in order to move at that faster speed during the concentric phase of each repetition, but generally going faster is better. So that's why if you're ever like in a, I got to pass a PT test for push-ups or something like that, go fast, develop practice fast. You don't want slow grinding repetitions. It's just going to burn you out a whole heck of a lot faster. Excuse me there. Math, math is saying, I started running recently and uh, not stopping when it becomes uncomfortable. It's definitely one of my favorite aspects of running. Fully agree there, Math, math. That's one of the things that I've noticed too, is that mental toughness training has a very strong influence over our ability to push ourselves. When I was bike racing on a weekly basis uh, back in Vermont, I always noticed I could push myself so much harder in the summer months, just because bike racing is still to this day, the hardest thing I've ever done because you're literally going all out, total red line the entire time for like an hour. And even then for mountain biking, you're pushing a sprint in between that. So imagine running that 5K as fast as you can and per per periodically during that 5K, you're sprinting to like, you know, telephone poles and things like that. That's mountain biking. So I would reset kind of my situation of what I could do to push myself. And then when I would go and do pull-ups and stuff, it's like, oh yeah, I can push myself way harder than what I thought I could do just because I had that frame of reference. So that's a very good, good point. Absolutely. Let's see. <clears throat> Dan Osek is saying, hey Matt, using the ISO chain and ISO max and not progressing on overhead press. Should I change the angle or keep trying to improve the weak angle? You can try and change the angle, but usually when there's a uh, limitation there, it's rarely the limitation of the muscles doing the actual exercise and it's a stability limitation. So with the overhead press, assuming again, you're standing for this, uh, is that make sure you're using plenty of stability tension throughout your body, particularly in your back. So when you're pressing, you want to make sure your shoulders are back and packed pretty tight. Your lats should be engaged. Traps are engaged. Also hips, quads, and glutes should be engaged because fundamentally you're driving force down your body. And if that force is kind of snaking and squirreling around and you're all twisted around, it's not a very stable position that you're in. So you're probably hitting the limitations of that stability as opposed to the actual pressing motions. Also make sure that you're using your triceps with that. A lot of times people think shoulder press and they're trying to press entirely with their shoulders and their triceps are not really contributing much to the uh, activity itself. Make sure those triceps are really, really engaged. And uh, that may be a good way to go into a new level for you. And last one, before we get into our uh, four strategies, XY is saying, fast question, how long should I take a break between full fatigue workouts? And it's good while I'm doing night shifts and my recovery time longer than usual. 
So yeah, I, when it comes to recovery of any kind, I always tell people rest is needed because there are so many factors that go into how fast you recover, both between sets and between workouts. And that's why I don't have any particular time frame for either. I don't have a set amount of time I rest between sets and I don't have a set amount of time I rest between workouts either. So sometimes it could be two days, sometimes four days, you know, whatever I'm feeling like my muscles need. And that way I'm more correlating the, or uh, more making the decision on go again when I can push myself rather than some arbitrary number someone recommends on a YouTube video of like, yeah, rest two minutes or rest two days or three days or what, who, who, how the hell do they know? There's so many factors that go into how much rest you're going to need that anything that I give you as a blanket recommendation is little more than just a guess, guesswork. Rest as needed, go when you can. And that's usually the, the better way to go about it. It makes it more fun as well. It's one of those things that you're going to have more motivation for because you're not, one, forcing yourself to work out when you're not really feeling it and you're kind of still tired. And two, you give yourself the freedom to work out like, I'm ready to go. Let's go. And you're not saying, yeah, but I got to wait like three more days. Oh, crap. This is, I want to go. Well, then go. You know, your muscles don't care how long you rest. They only care about if they're getting recovery or not. And if you get it faster or slower or whatever, well, give yourself whatever you need. And that way, it's the uh, best way to go about it. So anyway, push it beyond failure. So we've established what failure is. Failure is not a state where the muscle is depleted. It's just your inability to produce a certain amount of tension for that exercise. That's what failure actually is. So these strategies will give you the ability to produce more fatigue simply by saying, okay, you can't produce that much tension. Let's just do something that, produce, that requires less tension. And of course, I already kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the best ways of doing this, classic drop set. So you have a certain amount of resistance that you're working with and you're working the muscle with a certain amount of tension, you know, getting whatever reps you like. And again, I don't care what reps you get. It's all about time. But if you get to a point where you're, okay, I'm really struggling here. And then you put the weight down and you immediately go with a lighter weight, lighter dumbbells. You move the pin there. Or if you're doing body weight training, you regress to an easier exercise. So if you're doing pushups, pushups on the knees, or if you're doing pushups, like I was the other day, uh, with the gentleman who's gone on the floor and then we go up to a ledge and that way you can drop set to that. So that way you're getting more fatigue in the muscle just because you're able to push the muscle with a level of tension that it can further sustain. That's, that's all there is to it. And uh, it can be very satisfying to do that, but don't get too carried away with it. You know, I see some people, they, they'll be on a weight machine and they'll have the pin like halfway up the stack and they'll just keep going for reps on every single little plate <laughs> there. It's like, you don't need that. Usually my rule of thumb is two, maybe three decreases in whatever level you're at, because chances are very good. If you're going too small, you're gonna, well, you're getting there and then you go down one plate and they only get one or two reps. So you're not really changing that much. But if you drop down too much, you're gonna eventually get to the point where you can just kind of keep going. <laughs> you just keep going and you're not creating that much more fatigue. You're just kind of more in cardio mode at that point. So usually two to three levels of drop down is what I recommend. Even sometimes just one can be a good way. A grind style calisthenics as we have our finisher phase. So you're doing like pull-ups and then you drop down, you get like body weight rows. And then you could do like body weight rows with uh, your knees bent, right? And that's going to be more fatigue than you may have with just the straight pull-ups. Same thing with dips to push-ups, push-ups to the knees. Uh, basic strategy. It uses, usually is best for big compound movements, this drop set type of idea. You can do it with bicep curls and things like that. But generally, drop set training and even many of these strategies, probably best to uh, bring about with uh, your compound movements, your basic push, pull, and squat movements are going to be the way to go. It's uh, a little bit more satisfying than that sort of deal. So that's drop sets. Uh, recommend doing it if you are struggling to kind of push yourself, especially if you're noticing that you're having trouble with technical uh, failure kind of things. So if you're doing curls or something and you're really getting some body English in there or you're noticing that your technique is faltering, it's always easier to maintain better technique with lower 
levels of resistance on the body. So that's a good way to make sure that you can be uh, have a higher level of integrity with your technique because the loads are getting lighter. So it's not quite as hard on the technical side of things, but you're still pushing the muscular fatigue. And again, you don't want much rest with these sorts of things. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to put the 30s down, wait about 30 seconds, scroll on your phone, and then pick up the 20s and go. It's like, no, you've rested. You, <laughs> you know, you're back to the 30s. The point is to change quickly. Uh, which is why a lot of times it doesn't work all that well for barbell training. Sometimes if someone is doing drop sets with barbell training, they'll have a person on like each end of the barbell to quickly strip a plate off. Um, I've seen people do this with uh, just loading up like a barbell with 25s or 10s, small plates. So that way you're not swapping plates around. They'll rack the bar if they're doing bench press, buddy on each end takes off a 10 and they'll keep going, rack it, take off a 10, keep going, that sort of thing. Usually machines and uh, dumbbells and uh, body weight is a good way to go about that one. That's strategy number one. Strategy number two, as I kind of uh, alluded to this one a little bit earlier where um, I talked about pausing and then going. And this is, uh, goes by a number of uh, training strategies or names. Uh, sometimes I'll have people say, what do you think about you know, Bulgarian moot training or something? I made that up, but I get these sorts of things. I'm like, what the hell is Bulgarian moot training? And inevitably it's always, Someone has put a different name on, you do a set, you, you get to the point where you're feeling like you can't continue, and then you stop for like three seconds, five seconds, or just for a couple of deep breaths, and then you keep going. And this strategy, I really like, especially if you feel like you're hitting a limit of you know, internal dialogue, a mental or emotional limit, where you feel like, okay, I, I just can't keep doing this anymore, and you stop for just a couple of seconds, take a couple deep breaths, don't get up, don't get a drink of water or anything. You're just literally giving yourself a few seconds and then you pick it up and you keep going. Because usually when we've got those internal dialogues, the second we stop, that dialogue shuts right off and then you can keep going again. So this is a good way to help ensure that you are physically pushing against the limitations of your neuromuscular system and not an emotional limit or you know, a mental limit or something of that nature. If you are struggling with a certain number, like you know, we were talking about doing 20 body weight rows, it, it may be a mentally imposed limitation there. A lot of I see that happen a lot, where people will be cranking out the reps, and it's just as soon as they get to that number that they feel like, okay, all I can do is 20 reps, I can only do 20 reps, they start to kind of psychosomatically get the fatigue piled on so that they're stopping at 20. There's lots of strategies to kind of overcome that. One of the more common ones I've come across where people say, stop counting reps, go by time anyway. And that way, you know, people just blow right past it because they're not associating it with a number. There's no uh, psychosomatic, you know, 18, 19, oh boy, this is all I've got, 20. They're just still 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, because they're not counting. So that's a good way to go about it. But the stop, pause training, as I like to or a stop and go training is a good way to go about that. You just stop the exercise, take a couple deep breaths, and then kind of eke out a few more repetitions. Inevitably, you almost always can get two, maybe three more, maybe four or five more if you're really kind of stopping premature. And then you can stop, try it again. But uh, you'll know that uh, you're at your real limit when you stop pause for a few seconds, you try and do it again. And the muscles are like, nope, <laughs> not having it. And you're like, yep, okay, that's that's towards the end of what I can do with that. And so it's a good way to break past those limitations. All right, let's see if we got some more questions coming on in. Suspend in uh, mofo. You might love your content, sir, thank you. Is it recommended to do drop sets on the end of every set or just the last one? Oh, fantastic. So these types of strategies, because they elicit a high degree of fatigue, know that they do beat up the body. They do kind of fry out your nervous system. They do uh, really recover, require a good amount of recovery, uh, which again, if you're using more of a free form type of recovery, like I talked about earlier, can be a good thing. So it can really beat you up. So usually once, maybe twice, this would be a finisher phase if you're following my grind style calisthenics program or my push pull squat program drop sets pause rep sets these are finishers because that's the other thing to consider too is when we are producing a very high degree of fatigue in the muscle 
we are severely compromising our ability to perform subsequent sets, or at least you should be. You know, if you came to me and you're like, I pushed a failure every time and I always get the same number of reps. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not even close to failure. Because if you got to close to your true neuromuscular limit on say push-ups, and you get 30 push-ups, let's say, and then you get a drink of water, or you kind of shake it out a little bit, or like, okay, set number two, you should go from like 30 to 12. <laughs> you should put your hands on the floor and your muscles immediately go, uh-uh, nope, <laughs> not having this. Like, oh God. You know, if you get 30 and then you take that break. And you're like, here we go. And your muscles are like, yeah, let's get 30 again. You weren't even close to the level of fatigue that you could potentially generate. It should be extremely taxing for a subsequent set. So if you're trying to do things that require a good degree of practice, you know, like strength training, for example, like real strength training where you're generating a high degree of tension, you don't want to do this stuff right away because it's really hard to get strong when you're tired. <laughs> you can't strengthen tired muscles. It's that simple because your muscles have to contract harder to grow stronger. That's what strength is, how much tension is in your muscle. And when they're really fatigued, it just ain't gonna happen. So that's why in push-pull squat and my grind style calisthenics program, we have the strength phase first, where you're keeping fatigue low and at bay. You don't want a lot of fatigue when you're developing skills and proficiency and working on technique and strength, because strength is technically a skill, you know, and all these things. You wanna stay relatively fresh. And that's why I say do as many sets as you can get, being able to proficiently perform the exercise. But once you start to notice the fatigue is mounting, your performance is going up, all right, then you go into your hypertrophy phase. Then you use these strategies and you just fry and cook the hell out of the muscle. Because now it's like, what are you going to get? <laughs> you know, If you're doing front levers, for example, and you're getting to the point where your lats are just shot and they're tired, more work isn't going to do you any more good. All you're going to do is just make yourself more tired, but you're not going to get better at front levers. You're sure as hell not going to get stronger for that workout session. So you might as well, you know, go to the lat pull down machine or get some body weight rows or something like that and just fry it out if you want to. Again, create that stimulus for more of the hypertrophy. But yeah, we want to make sure we're smart about these sorts of things. It's always that balancing act between time and tension, volume versus intensity. They're kind of mutually ex exclusive. So when we're going after our objectives with our muscles, do you want it to be stronger because you can generate more tension? Well, in that case, fatigue is the enemy. Volume? Well, then in that case, you're fighting fatigue. And so you've got to make sure you know what you're focusing on because heaven forbid you should be working on creating the wrong stimulus for the goals that you want. Never just assume that hard work pays off. It is most entirely possible to work your ass off and then realize, crap, I was going in the wrong direction. You know, just because you're burning gas and driving at 100 miles an hour doesn't mean you're heading in the right direction. All right, Dave is asking about when doing overcoming ISOs, do you ever feel like your muscles are emptying out as you go? Also, when you consider ladders and these hypertrophy style tricks, for more or more strength in between. Yeah, I fully agree. I like using the strength training. I like having uh, ladders, particularly as a warm up. Excuse me, it's getting darker here. Let me change the ISO settings on my camera. I was shooting something for Dragon Door the other day. I need to readjust here. Let me just put that to automatic so you people can actually see me. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, so ladders, I really like, cause one of the things that I'm learning very quickly is that the ability to generate more strength and skill or proficiency in something is also very much influenced by our ability to kind of ease into, uh, what we're doing. If we go into it too hard and fast, then it can be quite a shock to the system. So for example, like I've been doing overcoming isometrics like crazy lately, it's kind of been about. 80% of my, my strength training at this point, if I'm honest. Uh, one of the things I've noticed is that I can get my muscles to contract a heck of a lot harder if I have a little bit of a longer ramp up period in those sets. So in overcoming isometric world, you don't just go from relaxed to all 100% tension, like 100% like, like that. That's very hard on the system, hard on the joints, but you're also probably not gonna generate that much tension. But if I have a gentle five second ramp up 
and I'm really kind of applying that force gradually, I can push my muscle to a much higher degree of tension. It also goes for the workout as a whole. I'll almost always now start off with a couple of holds of the overcoming isometrics at a lower level because, you know, with dynamic training, you do this. If I'm going to do heavy weighted pull-ups, I'm not going to just start with my max weight. I'm going to start with a set of body weight rows, then a set of regular pull-ups, then maybe a set with like 25 pounds. And then I'll go to like a set with 40 or 50 pounds. Uh, you ramp it up. Being able to do that allows your neuromuscular system to ramp up a little bit more and it's easier uh, to be able to access that. So that's the up part of the ladder. And then the down part, of course, would be the drop set. So I love ladders for that uh, purpose. I think it's fantastic. Uh, especially if you're kind of, you know, if you're going into a workout and you're feeling like, oh boy, I just kind of don't want to do this, start easier. Start at a lower level of resistance and ramp up gradually. You don't have to go 100 miles an hour. In bike racing, we learn this one the hard way real fast because if you're not ramped up and you're just standing there cold on the start line and then they say, go, you're going to be gassed out in about five minutes, if that, <laughs> if you make it that long. But if you take a lap and you do a couple sprints and you ramp yourself up for a good 20 minutes or so before the race, then you can go at a much higher degree of uh, speed. You can push yourself a lot harder for a lot longer. Joseph Bello, it's good to see you as always. I saying, when I do push-ups, I'm not all the way to failure. But in my third set, I struggle to push myself off the floor. But if I stop for a few seconds, I still do two or six more. Yeah, exactly. There's pause rep training there for you. So you are going to failure of something. You know, because it's like, okay, I'm not quite getting off the floor. And again, failure is that. Failure is nothing more than the ability to generate a specific amount of tension in the muscle beyond that amount of time. So if you give yourself a little bit more rest time, there you go. <laughs> You're going to be able to continue. Dan Osaka saying, Matt, great subject. I usually train to failure with two sets, usually 30 seconds each on the ISO chain. Uh, very good. That's very similar to what I'm doing these days, actually. Uh, if I switch to maybe a four by 10, I don't feel like I've gone to failure. Does it matter? Um, probably not too much, although with isometrics, it's probably a different story. And the reason is because when we're talking about generating fatigue, we are talking about time. We're talking about tension. But when we talk about time, we're also talking about time of you know tension relative to rest. So if you're doing 30 seconds of a hold, you're going to generate a lot more fatigue just because it's burning like crazy. But if you get 10 seconds and then you rest and 10 seconds and rest and 10 seconds and rest, that's still 30 seconds, but there's more rest peppered in there. And you can experience this with just regular dynamic training as well. If you're like, I'm going to do 100 push-ups, you do one push-up and you rest for a bit. And then you do like two or three and you rest and then you get like a few more rests and you do it throughout the day. You're just not going to create that much fatigue. It's kind of like having a, a burrito in the microwave and you're just turn on for three or four seconds, then turn it off, turn it on for three or four seconds, turn it off. How well is it going to cook? You want to keep that pressure on. Um, generally, when it comes to shorter bouts of time, that's better for strength because you're just putting more tension in. You can't do the same amount of tension for uh, 30 seconds as you can for 10 or the other way around. But uh, with isometrics, it may not matter all that much because you're always generating a lot of tension when it comes to isometrics, which is one of the great things about it. So it probably will matter when it comes to isometric training uh, because we don't want too much rest because it just makes it harder to produce more fatigue in the muscles if we have too much rest. Super Prime 117 is saying, hey, Matt, another question about... Shock training, what is your opinion on myofascial, my, myofascial release, foam rolling and active release technique? Do you think it help with uh, shock absorbing and injury prevention? I don't know enough to have a valid opinion on it, but to be perfectly honest with you, I think it's kind of getting a little faux pas right now. Um, in my line of work uh, with trainers around me all the time, I work at nobody's foam rolling anymore. Like I work in several gyms. Many of them have many trainers. I don't know anybody who employs foam rolling at all. It, that five, six years ago, everyone and their mom was foam rolling, but I don't know of anybody doing it anymore, which is kind of leading me to the idea that just anecdotally, they're 
They're like, eh, it doesn't really do that much. Uh, second is my general take when it comes to anything, when it comes to muscles, is anything in a relaxed state is probably not going to do you much good. Bottom line. Uh, the whole point of everything we do needs tension flowing through the muscles, needs some sort of tension. Now, let me give you a little anecdotal story here, which may or may not support or may disprove that what I'm saying here, though. Um, a friend of mine is a very skilled massage therapist, and I've never been one for massage. And every time I, I get massages, I'm just in absolute agony. It's just like, oh my God, my back, like, you know, my God, you must be driving your elbow clean through me. And she's like, I'm barely touching you. Like try stretching a little bit now. Okay. Kind of, kind of stuff. Very tight, very sensitive. I mean, even, you know, back in the day, you know, girlfriends would come up and start rubbing my shoulders and I'd be like, oh my God, like you've got hands like the Hulk. Jeez, you're killing me here. She's like, dear Lord, you're like, what is wrong with you? But um, I've made a habit of going to this massage therapist ever on a monthly basis. And now she can lean the hell into me like crazy. And I'm totally comfortable with it, like no discomfort at all. And, you know, I talked to her about this and we talked about it. I was like, yeah, when you know I first saw you, you could barely handle any pressure on your back without jumping off the table practically. And now I can pay, practically stand and stomp on your back and you're perfectly fine. I'm much looser. So I've probably got more of that fascial release. But the question is why? Because yes, I've been getting that massage, although it's once a month. But the other thing too is my tension activation is a hell of a lot better in my back over the past couple of months. And my range of motion in my back musculature, especially my shoulder blades, is way better whenever I'm doing any sort of rows or pull-ups or anything like that. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing is I've got a lot better tension and I've got a lot more range of tension in the muscles. So is that because I've released myofascial, you know, I had myofascial release from the massage or is that because I've been able to get more tension control largely due to the isometrics and having that ability to send tension through my muscles much more effectively, that's caused the release to happen. And now when I go to the massage, it, I mean, it's, it feels good, it's relaxing, but it feels like it barely does anything because I'm already released. But the, I guess the real bottom line here is that we're not supposed to be tight there and I don't think it's the foam rolling that's doing it. When the big one was IT bands, right? All every runner I knew, I was like, oh, IT bands are so tight. Rolling out the IT band six weeks later, like, how's the IT? Oh, it's still tight. Still got to roll it out. No one has tight IT bands from a lack of foam rolling. <laughs> okay. You shouldn't need to roll out your IT bands. It, it's one of those things that you just don't need to do. However, if you strengthen your TFL, which is where your IT band is connected to, and you strengthen and improve the tension control and strength and mobility in your hips, those IT band issues disappear and you never have to worry about it again, but you're never releasing anything because your muscles are just strong and they have good tension control and the tension flows through. So I always kind of look at it like tension control, tension flows through muscles, it, it, just like an electric current. And if you've got that good flow going on, then it's kind of like combing through knots in your hair. You know, it's, it's hard when you've got the knots, but as you send tension through the fibers, it just naturally keeps the knots from forming and you don't ever need to release it. So if you came to me and you're like, I've got all this tight fascial stuff, it's like you probably got weaknesses and poor tension control somewhere. And all the foam rolling and massage in the world probably isn't gonna help you until you actually get those muscles working properly. That's my current state of it. I fully reserve the right to change my mind uh, and when I new, learn new information. But that going off of what I've learned and what I've experienced, that's where I would go with things. Joseph Bello is saying, when I lunge squat, I can go for five minutes, feeling in my muscles, but I can do a little more. Uh, so should I try supersetting with another exercise or lunge is enough? So usually, again, we, we're trying to develop fatigue here, folks. And if the exercise is too light, then you're not going to develop that much fatigue. Yeah, you're going to get a good burn. I mean, yeah, I go hiking and my muscles are really burning and stuff. But if you can do it for that long, it's not hard enough. Bottom line, my general uh, recommendation is if you can do an exercise for a minute or more, it's too easy. 
you're, you're, it's just too easy. Yeah, you can build muscle with that sort of thing. As long as you're getting that d degree of fatigue where you're no longer able to kind of go. But I would say it, it's too easy. You're, you're using an exercise that's too light in the resistance. Use a harder technique. Um, use a weight, you know, if you like. Um, bigger range of motion. Legs are hard with that because they've got crazy endurance. So it takes a lot of work to really push the legs. So a couple of these strategies may be good for you after those lunges. But yeah, if you can do something for five minutes, too easy. Too easy. It needs something harder. That's my uh, take on it sort of thing. Uh, math, math, last question here before we get in the last two here is when I train body part two times a week, let's say back, is it better to have one vertical pulling focus day, one horizontal uh, pull focus day or mix them up each day? Yeah, probably in that case, it probably doesn't matter too much. Uh, just because uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, are you basically doing the same exercises for the same weight and reps and so forth? As long as the work you're getting done is relatively the same throughout a week uh, and you're pushing that fatigue, uh, then you're probably fine either way. You've got, when it comes to this sort of thing, you've got so much freedom to work out most any way that you like, as long as it's heavy enough and as long as you're pushing the fatigue enough. You could pretty much program your workouts and do whatever the hell you want. Use any kind of exercise, any kind of tools, any kind of set and rep schemes you like. As long as you're getting those objectives met, that's what matters most. So have fun. You know, and uh, recognize the things that your body and your mind just naturally gravitates towards. Because if you feel like I'm better off doing this exercise and then this one and stuff, you probably should make those changes because you have the freedom to do pretty much damn near anything you like, as long as you're pushing yourself hard enough and long enough to create that fatigue, you can pretty much do whatever else. So let's get into a couple more of these strategies here. Uh, so one of the things that I like for really pushing, quote, past failure, and we were talking a little bit about isometrics before, is using isometrics. Because remember that failure is nothing more than reaching a point where you can no longer generate a certain amount of tension. That's what it really means. Now, when you can't generate that tension anymore with dynamic exercise, you stop moving. <laughs> that's, that's literally what failure means. If you're doing a bicep curl and you have 30 pounds dumbbell and then you can't do it anymore, you're, you literally are reaching a point where you can't generate enough tension in the bicep to continue curling that weight. That's what failure is. But with isometric, overcoming isometric specifically, uh, there is no minimum amount that you have to have no minimum or maximum amount of tension so you can really keep pushing <laughs> that muscle to an ever increasingly high number high um, high amount of fatigue without having to stop so having an isometric finisher can be very good for this purpose i did this with a client this morning she's like i just can't seem to really burn out my abs i can't get my abs tired i'm like oh step into my office my friend i've got ways and so we did some uh, stretch outs on suspension trainers because I love those. They're really hard. And again, you know, I don't want someone doing a plank for more than a minute. If you can do a plank for more than a minute, means we need a harder plank. <laughs> don't, don't train so easy. Uh, but those are great because you can really have a high degree of burnout in the muscle in like five reps if you know what you're really doing. So you did that. And then I had her drop set into what did I? Oh, ab. Um, it was uh, leg raises on the floor because that was easier. So she was able to get like maybe 10 because her abs were already pretty fried. Then after that, she immediately flipped over, went into a plank, and she's squeezing the floor together with her arms between and her feet. Uh, so that's just burning out whatever the heck is left. And we did that for about a 10 count. And believe me, that burned out her abs pretty good. <laughs> that, was, that was certainly very effective because it was drop sets with an ISO finisher. You employ a couple of different of these strategies together. And if you're not really burning out that muscle, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> so having that ISO finisher at the end can be very effective. Plus, it's a good, safe way to go about it as well. Um, drop sets similar with that sort of thing. Because especially with an exercise that requires proficiency to be safe, then at some point you're going to burn out and no longer be able to maintain the technique. And there's maybe a bit of a higher risk, things like, you know, Olympic lifting, kettlebell snatches, that sort of thing. Some exercises just are not really meant to be pushed to failure that much. So having isometric finishers 
is good. Coincidentally, uh, the uh, Dragon Door ISO chain and ISO Max that came out, one of the neat things about it with their load setting is it actually allows you to push isometrics to failure. Because before that, you couldn't do that because there is no failure point with overcoming isometrics. There is no point where you can no longer generate enough tension because you can always generate enough tension. But with the load setting on the ISO chain and the ISO Max, that's effectively like loading up a barbell and saying, I need to generate X amount of tension. And when you do, when you meet and exceed that, you get the beeps. And it starts beeping. So if you've got a bicep curl, right, for 100 pounds, you meet and exceed 100 pounds, it starts beeping. But as soon as the ability to generate that tension decreases, you don't have the beeps anymore. And that's failure. That's literally what failure is, is the inability to generate a certain amount of tension. But if you're using that isometric, you're not getting the beeps, but you can still keep pushing. You can still keep tension and trying to get the beeps. And you may very well not because you can't generate that much tension, but you can keep producing more fatigue. So that's one of the big reasons why the ISO chain and ISOMAX can be so effective for helping you build muscle is because you have that ability now to push your muscles to failure and beyond with isometric training, which is a lot of fun to do. A lot of fun. And again, it keeps you honest. It's like, yeah, but I can do this. It's been like 30 beeps now and it keeps beeping. I'm like, then it's not hard enough. <laughs> you know, you should have something. You're like, I'm really struggling to get 10 beeps. There you go. Now you're heavy and you're really training a little bit more for the strength side of things. All right, let's get to one more, a couple more questions here before we go to the last one. Uh, Trizzy BTW, is there a certain age when metabolism slows down? Sorry for the off topic question. No, please folks, ask me anything. Literally, it doesn't even need to be fitness related. You can ask me, you know, what did I do last night when I went out to Golden, if you want. But um, no, uh, it's interesting now. A lot of the research is coming out that there is a metabolic slowdown with age, but a lot of the uh, a lot of the ways the data is being collected and uh, interpreted is that it's a lot later in life than we may think. I mean, hell, I remember growing up and people telling me, you know, once you're over 30, your metabolism is shot to hell. You know, I even had one person say, boy, after I turned 25, whew, I'm like, really? 25, huh? <laughs> Jeez. And that, that's always, I think, is so funny about the age thing because I've never heard a consistent number from anybody. You know, I've had people say, oh, once I turned 25, it was downhill. Then once I turned 40, it was downhill. I had a guy one time, once I hit 75, man, that's when things really started to change. I'm like, things were good until 75. I, I hope I'm like that kind of thing. It does happen, but now some of the research, if you look at it, comb through it a little bit, again, I think there's stuff that's stronger by science. It seems to be in the 60s where things can start to really shift around. But even then, it's probably a lot slower than we think it does. The stuff we usually attribute to that slowdown with age is more due to lifestyle and stuff. You know, in college, I was walking everywhere and I was active literally all day, every day, and I was bike racing after college. I was sitting in a truck delivering fitness equipment all around Vermont and sitting on my butt for nine hours a day. That's a big lifestyle change. So a lot of times it's that. A lot of times, and, a, and again, a lot of times it's mental too. If you tell yourself, boy, once I'm hit 40, then it's all downhill, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And inevitably, the people who seem to be young, even though they're at a spry age of 60 and whatever, people say, well, how did you maintain this youthful vigor and metabolism and stuff. And they're like, I just never saw a reason why I couldn't do it. Like yesterday I could do 10 pull-ups. Today I can do 10 pull-ups. Last week I was 180 pounds. Why wouldn't I be 180 pounds this time? So what if I had a birthday during that time? Nothing happened in that week. So why would anything change? <laughs> and that men mindset I think is a very good mindset to have of, well, I was fine last week. Why would I change this week? Why would I change the next week? And before long, those weeks add up to years. So there is, of course, inevitable changes with age. But as I always tell people, I never train anybody according to age. Uh, I train them according to their abilities because I've never met a standard 40-year-old. <laughs> I've never met a classic 35-year-old. Every person I've ever trained in my 20 years of experience is always different. And I get people asking me, like, you know, you should write books for beginners or you should write books for people over 50 or, or 40 or something. I'm like, 
what in the world would I possibly say? I have no approach whatsoever that I would take age into account. Like, oh, you're 50, therefore you should train this way. What way? Got me. I wouldn't train you differently from a 20 year old. I would train you differently if you have trouble squatting. <laughs> and yes, age certainly can have that influence in many ways, but I'm not going to make assumptions. Anybody who's like, well, I'm over 40 or 50 or whatever, I should train this way, you're guessing. You're basing it on a guess. Don't base your training on guesses, people. Base it on your abilities. You know, I've, I've had people twice my age run circles around me. I had a 70-year-old blow by me on a ski hill one time doing nearly 90 miles an hour. I get my butt kicked every week in Taekwondo by people who are past their retirement age. I'm not an age is not an, uh, just a number kind of guy, but at the same time, don't let it slow you down. All right, I think I, I'm off on that uh, rant a little bit. Oh, this is a good question. Let me get to this. Nico M, what experience of adversity made you stronger? Fantastic. Um, I mean, on the macro level, I would say, uh, you know, it's going to be one of those things of everything. <laughs> you know, fitness in general for the first 15 years or so was just a fight every single day. It was a fight to work out. It was a fight to eat well. It was a fight against my body. Every day was a fight. Like I was very lucky in life. I grew up in a very stable household. I've always had really good friends, really good teachers and mentors. You know, a lot of the challenges that people have with abusive relationships and broken homes and just bad things, I never had any of that, thank heavens. But Nonetheless, I decided to screw up most of my life and impart upon myself anyway with fitness. And uh, yeah, it's been a lot of dysfunctional uh, eating disorders, a lot of dysfunctional exercise habits, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, that was that made my whole life adversity from every single day. And it's through overcoming all of that that I now know what I know. And so, you know, a lot of people are like, I'm glad I went through my trials and tribulations. That made me stronger and wiser. I'm like, yeah, I wish I could have just read, read the books that I now write. And if I knew that stuff when I was younger, my life would have been a hell of a lot easier. Oh, boy. Nico's also asking, uh, how much do you use free weights? Uh, do you need free weights? Sorry. Uh, uh, oh, you asked two. Do you need or do you use free weights? Yep, they're just a tool, man. Personally, I haven't lifted any weights in nearly 15 years. It's all been body weight pretty much. Uh, and if there's free weights, it's strapped to me like on a dip belt or anything like that. But at the end of the day, it's not about the tool. Your body doesn't give a damn what you're using for an exercise. It just knows time and tension and just use whatever's easiest for you. I personally have always found it's a hell of a lot easier for me to work harder with body weight training. And now, of course, with isometrics, dear God, nothing is easier for <laughs> working a muscle than the, those isometrics kind of thing. But uh, use whatever you, you like, of course. But uh, yeah, I haven't personally used free weights on the regular for my workouts. Uh, oh, since, you know, President Bush Sr. was in office pretty much. <laughs> Mad Mad, another fatigue technique I like is saying uh, in a stretch position, a dip, for example, we can no longer do a full rep. Oh, yeah, pause training, a very good way to go about it. That can be a lot of fun too. You just get into uh, the isometric. Because remember, when we are doing dynamic training, failure is the inability to produce enough tension to keep moving in that exercise. You can still hold the isometric for a little bit. This works particularly well for pull-ups, where you're doing pull-ups and you're like, okay, and you're trying to pull up and a lot of people, they'll just give up and they're like, oh, failure. And it's like, they collapse. And it's like, that's just mentally giving up. That's the equivalent of curling dumbbells and just dropping them on the floor and going like, oh, oh, poor me. Oh, it's so hard. You're not fooling anybody. But you can do the pull-up, come down, you know, and just try and hold yourself there. And that's going to get you burned even a little bit more. And it's very satisfying to finish with that sort of thing. Divine27 says, you're awesome, bro. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Spicy J with the Jack Garfield. It's always good to see you, my friend. Met long time, no see, my friend. Been doing inverted rows to develop uh, pull, but I've long had stiff, cracking finger joints. Yeah, growing up. My grip gives out up long before my back or lats. Gloves? Question mark. That might be a good way to go about it. That's interesting that you have that. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It 
it depends on what that's what's causing that. Of course, I wonder if there's some sort of like a tendon, or even maybe a an arthritic sort of thing starting to develop in there. Structural uh, might. I mean, if you're ever at a doctor or something like that, have them take a look at your hand, just see if they might be able to look at it, because I want to make sure there's no structural just condition going on in the hand. Of course, try gloves. Uh, I like using gloves because it can also challenge your grip quite a bit more. Um, try different diameter bars, wrap a towel around the bar, make it a little thicker. I personally have a lot more discomfort in my hand if the bar is too thin. My hands, I don't think they're very big hands, but I've always preferred a beefier grip, a beefier bar. So try wrapping a towel around it. Actually, I would try that before the gloves. It gives it just a little bit of padding. Might be a good way to go about it. It's one of the things that could uh, potentially save, give you a cushion on those joints uh, with the towel instead. Try that. I'm curious how that works out for you. But anyway, uh, we're talking about past failure training. Negatives are another one. Negatives are classic in the world of bodyweight training because, again, you don't need as much tension to lower a weight as you do to lift it because failure is nothing more than the ability to produce a certain amount of tension. So you can use less tension doing negatives or trying to control yourself. So if you're doing pull-ups, for example, and you're like, I can't do any more, you can kind of jump up on the bar and lower yourself down gradually, fighting it down. Jump up, lower yourself down, maybe get another one. Same thing with push-up variations. So if you're doing push-ups and you're really kind of struggling, then you just kind of put your knees down, you get up into a top position and lower yourself down gradually. And you put your knees down, you get back up and you lower yourself down. Very good. Just make sure that you have safety in mind with this one. You don't want to be caught under a weight or you don't want to you know, lower yourself down and then be like, I'm stuck. <laughs> you know, I can't get out of this position kind of thing. That's why a lot of times in the free weight world, people will have friends help them with negatives. Like if you're doing bicep curls, you do biceps and then a friend would help you get that last curl and then you would lower it down and then they would grab and help you get it back into position and then you would lower it down and stuff. It's a little bit more of a, a taxing way to go about it. it can really cause a lot of soreness damage to the muscles. So don't use it to excess, especially at first, maybe just a couple of quick repetitions uh, of negatives to try it at first. It can be extremely taxing. Nico is coming in with the awesome questions here. Let's wrap things up with these here. What's the best piece of advice you've ever received inside and outside of the gym? Um, that's a good question. Let me get to that one in just a a couple of seconds. I think the not so much advice, but just one of the best lessons I've ever learned is just recognizing that hard work doesn't always pay off. In fact, it frequently doesn't. Uh, that you need to know what you're doing with your work. You want to make sure you're focused on productivity. That it's not about how hard you can bust your own tail. Because hard work very frequently does not pay off. Uh, very frequently, it's very wasteful. Because at the end of the day, hard work is nothing more than investment. You're investing your time and your energy and sometimes your money and stuff. And an investor, you know, a financial investor would never just say, yeah, spend money and do whatever. Buy whatever stock. Just sink a ton of money in the stock market. You know, go blow 10 million on EFTs and Bitcoin. Sure, it's an investment. It's always going to pay off. Of course, that would be foolish. But yet when it comes to our sweat equity, if you will, we always assume it's just going to pay off, <laughs> that it's always going to be good. And sometimes it's an ego thing too. You know, we are often thinking, well, if I work hard, then that means I'm strong. That means I'm disciplined. That means I'm tough and much. No, it doesn't. It, sometimes it just means you're stupid <laughs> and you don't know what you're doing. Case in point, like what I used to do, because I used to hold that mantle and wave that flag really high. I'm the hardest worker in the room until uh, one of the guys who was a, kind of a mentor of mine, he was also a coach. And he's like, how much are you working these days? Because I was at the gym all the time. And I was like, oh, I'm working these hours and these hours. I'm doing this and that. And he's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> he's like, why? Why are you doing all that? It's like, because I'm this and that. I got a good work ethic. He's like, no, you're working all those hours because you don't know what you're doing because you're a bad trainer. <laughs> you know, is basically what he was saying. He's like, you suck because you're working all those hours and you're only helping five people. What is, no, you're doing this wrong. 
you know, and of course my frail ego at the time couldn't take that. It's like, oh, this guy's so lazy. You know, he's just a, he doesn't know what he's doing kind of thing. It's like, uh, he's the guy who's a millionaire. He's the guy who's in better shape than you are, Matt. You should be listening to him. But unfortunately, I was too young and foolish at the time. That's probably the case with most best advice we ever get is we disregard it initially. And then later on, we, we're, uh, grow a little bit more, hopefully mature a little bit. And you're like, oh, that guy really knew what he was talking about. I should have listened to him. <laughs> and uh, last to wrap us up, Supreme is saying, was your pay on doing double bounce uh, back squats to increase range of motion and for uh, shock training, go increase explosiveness, like doing on uh, depth jump. So you're talking about shocking quite a bit, uh, a couple of times here, Super Prime. And uh, sh shocking is, is like muscle confusion. You know, it's, it's a marketing term. It doesn't mean anything. It's not something that actually has meaning to it. Uh, and be careful with that because a shock oftentimes just means abuse in the world of fitness. And this is a good example of busting tail and just assuming it's going to work out in the end. Uh, because we've long regarded the idea that the body changes because we stress it. That's not at all true. You can stress your body a hundred different ways and not have any progress whatsoever. In fact, it's probably going to hurt you. It's probably going to waste muscle and cause you to get weaker and stuff. I'm not saying that's happening here, but just because something is making you kind of on your heels and being like, oh my God, that was so hard. That doesn't mean it was productive. It's productive because you are accomplishing the fundamental objectives of fitness. Uh, are you putting more tension in the muscle? Then you're going to get stronger. Are you making the muscle work longer than normal? And that's endurance. Are you pushing to more fatigue, like the strategies we're talking today? That can potentially stimulate more hypertrophy. Are you improving your proficiency at how well you're doing an exercise? Then that can improve your skills and your functional performance. Uh, so any type of training that you're looking at, if it's not helping you do those things more, it's probably not going to help you do anything. And it's probably going to hurt you. Not literally by injury. I'm just saying you're putting energy into things that doesn't really do anything. And that's part of the thing about training, especially now in our social media days, is you can change a workout 50 different ways. You can do all sorts of things that are going to feel tough, but none of that matters any, anyway. It doesn't matter if it's harder. It doesn't matter if your muscles are screaming bloody murder as much as I love doing that. It doesn't matter how hard things feel. What matters is, are you doing things better? Are you leveling up your performance? So going to a deeper squat is something I love for mobility work and getting things. If you feel like, oh man, my muscles are really working harder and really producing more fatigue, deeper squat. Well, there's your answer. That's great. Good. You know, if it's like, yeah, they have to contract harder due to leverage. So it's probably going to make me stronger. Yes, it will. Absolutely. But, um, Anything that takes away from those is only going to hold you back. But don't let numbers and stuff dictate things too much. Like you're talking about bouncing and stuff out of it. Yeah. If I needed to back squat as much weight as possible, that'd be a good idea. But unless your goal is to move more iron through space, then who cares? You know, it's always about what's going on on the muscular level. What is happening to the actual muscle fibers? As my chemistry teacher once told me, if you want to know what's going to happen to an organi organization, organism, <laughs> you have to look at what's happening on the cellular level. Because what happens on the cellular level is what has the, um, it's, uh, it's something that uh, needs to be uh, taken into the micro if you want to handle the macro, is basically what I'm saying. But yeah, there's a hundred ways you can vary up your training. And most of it's probably not going to do anything. <laughs> it's just rearranging the proverbial deck chairs on the Titanic. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's more productive or effective. You always want to look at how is this getting more tension in the foot, in the muscles, more endurance or and or fatigue, improving your ability to do the exercise, in which case it needs to be specific to ability to do what, and also just simply being able to have more of a, you know, things like mobility, control, tension control, those sorts of aspects of your performance. That's it. If it's not helping you do those things, it's not doing anything. <laughs> those are your fundamental objectives of your training. 
And uh, that's some, I guess, going back on the ideas of what sort of advice do you wish you had, just because it's different doesn't mean it's better. You need a clear goal in your workouts in order to make progress. If you don't have a map with a compass, you're just going to wander around the woods forever. Yeah, sure. Not all who wander are lost. Sure. But I don't want to explore with this stuff. I want to have a very simple, clear, direct point A, point B, get me to where I want to go quickly and simply and easily. And I don't want to mess around sightseeing as it were. So there we go, folks. There you go. Four strategies. We got pause, rest training. We got our drop sets. We got isometrics and isometric finishers. And we've got our negatives for pushing your muscles beyond failure. And again, take this stuff you know, with a bit of a grain of salt because yes, muscular fatigue is correlated with creating a stimulus for hypertrophy. But more fatigue doesn't always mean more growth. Once you create a certain amount of fatigue, who knows how much that is, but more, it doesn't seem to help very much. So just make sure you're kind of leaving your muscles with your, or leave your workouts with your muscles kind of well cooked, as I like to say, and uh, make sure you're not doing it so much that you can't really recover before your next session. Rest as needed and come back stronger. So don't forget, check out all the resources down below, including my books on overcoming isometrics, suspension calisthenics, weighted calisthenics, grind style calisthenics, and so on for helping to support the show. But it's also much more deep dive into all the topics that I was talking about today, especially about using bodyweight training for building muscle and strength. And we will do this again next week. Talk to you then. Till then, be fit and live free.